You're listening to the Monday Night Community Show with Daniel on BRFM. This is the Daniel Monday Night Community Show on demand through YouTube. Thank you very much for choosing to listen to us through this method. If you'd like to keep up to date with when I add new interviews, then subscribe to this channel. Myself and Ed clearly have a connection. This is a surprise to me. Oh? Because I have also suffered just such a loss. Your wife left you? We well, never know these days. Anything's possible. No. My boyfriend left me. Left you what? Left me and moved in with someone else. Oh, that must have left you desolated. Yes. He went to Weatherby. Well, that's not so bad then. I hear it's really nice in the summer, so I've been told. Do you think he'll be back later? Your ex-boyfriend? I've no idea. No, Ed. This is a dubious question. My guess is that he will, but, but how should I know? I'm a receptionist, not his social secretary. I can't wait. This time. I'm very busy. Lots to do. And with that, she departs. At that point, I assume, well, actually, if I'm honest, I hope above everything else that this will be the end of it. I'm aware that this puts me in a very odd position. People will expect me to do something if she keeps returning. The do something is always implied but never defined. As we all get older, by definition, we all become more disappointed. This is just part and parcel of life, and nothing of any great importance should ever be read into it. But as each of us learns the harsh truth of who you know, not what you know, never commit yourself to something that could be turned against you in the future, and, most importantly, never make a decision on anything, let someone else do it, until such a time when they too are so word-weary that they want someone else to make the decision. At which point you need to find another person to place their neck on the block. The category of do something inevitably means do the very thing that no one else wants to do. And why would they? As I said, we all have a breaking point. We all have, from my experience in these matters, the thousand pound moment. The thousand pound moment is the moment we all have to face in our lives. This is when, having endured a problem of which you are neither responsible or empowered to solve, and you realise that when the same problem arises in the future, and arise it will, you will once again be the one in the hot seat. At that point, you would rather pay someone else a thousand pounds to deal with the said problem rather than yourself. You were the one who let the plumber into room 205. Well, he told me you called him. Have you seen the state of it? The condition which he's left it? I'm not permitted to leave my station, so seeing up two floors would prove a challenge. But the manager is in full throttle, and someone has to be the whipping boy. And that, after all, is what my job is really about. But then the thousand-pound moment presents itself when the plumber returns and... Problems in 205? Again? Your governor killed me last night. Oh, right. Um... You all right, mate? Um... You don't look well. You should take it a bit easier. Have a holiday. You're always here. I can't afford to be otherwise these days. However, this time, when the manager passes, I feel myself tense up. Did the plumber come in this morning? He did. Did he sort out room 205? He said he did. Excellent. Well done. Of course, in both situations, I never did anything. Whether the plumber was the greatest thing since sliced bread, or the worst thing for bakers since the creation of the pre-packed, pre-sliced loaf freely available in the supermarket, I would have nothing to do with it. But if it went well, or equally was left a complete pig's ear, I would be responsible either way. As for the thousand-pound moment, or moments as they ultimately come to be, if I'm honest, my skin just gets a little thinner with every thousand-pound moment that comes about. And there is never anything else to do but take a deep breath and plough on. I'm back. She was. And this time she was not laden down with shopping, nor was it raining outside. I read in the local paper in an interview that Edward usually leaves the hotel at about this time. Is that right? Actually, it was, but by now I was starting to get a bit uncomfortable with the tone of her questions. 
She seemed to know his actions better than anyone, or at least better than me, although in truth I wasn't really interested when he came or went. He said in the paper that due to the emotional journey of his character in the play, he has to prepare before going to the theatre each day. And uh, how does he prepare for just such a journey? Does he take a coat with him? He tries to get into the mind of the character, his strengths, his weaknesses, what makes him tick, what is his motivation. He says he uses the Stanislavski technique. Sounds exhausting. Uh, What does he do? He has a lie down to ready himself. So, according to Miss French, according to the newspaper, according to Edward, his preparation for his performance at the theatre that evening, and every evening to come, was to lie down and probably have a sleep. I bought my camera again. How many pictures of him and you do you have now? And I brought this. What? A programme of his show. Are you going to sell it on eBay? I said, and then regretted it. She looked honestly shocked that anyone would even think that she would do just such a thing. I would never do such a thing. I'm shocked that you would even suggest it. I am a true supporter of the arts, you know. Which I didn't, but then again, how would I know one way or the other? I went to see the exhibition of painting at the Town Hall. Well, that was last year. I can't go all the time. I have things to do. Like, uh, your job? Hmm. Hmm. Was mostly what I got whenever I mentioned the subject of employment. Now, I I want to be quite clear on this point. I have never found working for others a fulfilling business. In fact, mostly the very opposite. So when I would inquire about whatever line Miss French was in, or wished to be in, it was only ever an attempt at polite small talk, and was never out of any real interest on my part. I find the process of discussing work, almost any work, a deeply depressing endeavour. It was only that Miss French was so evasive on the subject that it started to engage my curiosity. So, uh, do you like your job? No. Do you find it interesting? No. Would you uh, like to progress in your employment and make a career out of it? No. And uh, what do you do again? Do you think he'll be long? I uh, I really don't know. He looked lovely last night. Did you go and watch the play again? It's my only pleasure. That's a bit sad. I don't drink or smoke or even take drugs. Like I said, it's a bit sad. But I do like seeing Edward in the show. He really brings the piece alive like no one else can. Well, there have been other productions in the past. But there's no one like him. I wouldn't know. I've not seen his performance, and although in my youth I I was keen on the theatre, with time my interest has faded. Not long now. She seems certain of her facts, and she once again turns out to be correct. But this time the uh, glint in his eye is not that of pleasant surprise, but resignation. Did Edward suspect that she would be waiting for him? Uh, To me it looks clear that he did. He does, in fairness, remain professional, holding out his arms as if to embrace an old friend. Sally. But now, and I may be wrong, but I don't think I am, there is the suspicion that this is now something that neither he or me is able to contain. What a surprise. I heard you attended the performance again last night. You were magnificent. I cried all the way through the final scene. I saw the price of the tickets recently at the theatre and it brought a tear to my eye as well. I've never been so betrayed. I'll never forgive you. I want you out of my life forever. Art imitating life, some might think. You are like a millstone around my neck. I felt at the time we could all sympathise with that. For I shall never forget what you have done to me. All my hopes and dreams dashed upon a rock. You will not destroy my spirit. I shall be back. And then back again and again. If you keep turning up, you'll know it better than me. Oh, no. I could never portray the depth of emotions that you bring to the role. You are too kind. Every night you always find the right way of saying the words. The lines. Bringing out the very essence of the Colonel. I'd like to leave at this moment, but I'm the only one that can't. Oh, 
you bound her, you cad. I've never been treated like this before in my life. She evidently has seen it so often that she now knows the script. I see the look on his face. He clearly doesn't know if he should give the correct response or not. Well, uh, Sally... I'm tempted to add, Frankly, my dear, I couldn't care less. I've got better things to do. But I don't. Thankfully, neither does he. That is very good. Um, you should have been an actress. Do you think I could be? Then I could be in the play. With you. The mask ever so slightly slips at this point, and sadly not before time. The prospect of being with Miss French eight times a week is not one that evidently thrills him. What started off as simply an enthusiastic fan is now descending into something else. And not a good something else. We would be something unique together. That I can see is probably true. But whether his wife would see it quite like that, I really couldn't say. I could see us on stage together, treading the boards... Finding the light, hitting the mark. Yes, uh, well, I... Um... Could you put in a word for me? A word? With the producer. They are bound to be looking for people. Producers always are. I can act. I was in a play at school. And a play, Juliet, and an amateur production once. Romeo, Romeo, where on earth are you? We did it in the modern language. The director said he was fed up with all those thous and these and do you bite your thumb at me and so on and so on. Miss French has been acting out the opening scene of Romeo and Juliet. If her rendition is anything to go by, one wonders if the audience at the time had the first idea of what they'd let themselves in for. I'm sure you were unforgettable. Based on what I'd just seen, so was I. The casting for the play is out of my hands, I'm afraid. But you're the star. You must have some influence. Really very little. Oh, please. Please have a word. See what you can do. At this point, she grabs his left hand with both of hers and raises all three as if in prayers to God himself. The effect is unsettling, to say the least, and the least said about this particular episode is probably the best. I wouldn't embarrass you. No, of course you wouldn't. But she already has. I'd learn all my lines. I'm sure you would. I'd always be on time. I'd never be late. I'd always be there. I'm sure you would. Gently, he uncoils her hands from his. Has he been in this situation before? He is considerate, kind, and seems to show genuine sympathy for her need, for him to like her, or maybe for someone, anyone, to believe in her. It has been really nice to see you again, Sally, but now I do have to go. He smiles sweetly at her and then steps away, turning to head for the door. And it is only at this point that he glares at me. Only then do I see the flash of anger that has obviously built within him, the accusing look that says, you have laden me with this burden. I feel some shame, because in some ways I agree with him. I didn't throw her out, although he did bring her in. However, I do not get long to lament the anger that Edward, or Ed, feels towards me before I am brought down to earth with a bump. Have you seen the state of this bullcock? I knew that whatever I said it was going to be wrong. Uh, I'm sorry? The bullcock? In 205? The condition of the flush system in 205 had in truth slipped my mind. The plumber, however, was determined to remind me. Now, there was a time when you'd have gotten years out of a good bullcock. Now, it's a throwaway world. No one cares. I could tell you some stories about bullcocks that would make you see a visit to the bathroom in a totally different light. I wasn't sure that I really wanted to know, but again, I tried to be polite, or at least non-committal. Really? Well, how interesting. Now, nah, the bullcock in 206... Compared to 205, a totally different story. Well, it would be, wouldn't it? Would it? One mate the last, the other throw away and replace. That's the attitude these days. Nothing's built to last. Well, if you say so. I mean, look at that piping. He holds up a piece of the U-bend. You see that? See it? I could smell it. Cheap, 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 cheap. His bird impressions were getting no better either. What was that? 
I said your bird impressions leave a lot to be desired. Gosh, you're a hard critic. And with that, Ballcock and you bend in hand, he left to inflict more griping about the fragility of modern plumbing and his limited range of birdsong on an unsuspecting world. <laughs>